All right, well, this image shouldn't be entirely uh, foreign, as I'm going to be co-opting here E.O. Wilson's imagery, or at least imagery that he's found relevant to the thesis that he provides in the book. So here we have a painting by Gauguin. Let's try and break down uh, some meaning from this portrait of his. So what's going on here? What's some of the important interviews? Think about the themes that we've talked about in this class. Think, think about reproductive fitness. Think about eusociality. Think about all the big things that we've talked about and how it might pertain to this image. Yeah. Ah, statue in the background. Okay, so a reference towards religion. And is the statue, can we tell, is the statue a, a good figure or a bad figure? Yeah, so, so I'm hearing a lot of ambiguity there. And I think there's uh, ambiguity embedded in it. We don't really, I don't know if we're supposed to know if it's malevolent or benevolent. Do you have something you wanted to add? Uh, your hand. It's a female figure, so maybe benevolent because fertility. Fertility? So ta oh, certainly this image is wrought with fertility imagery, right? There are a couple themes, though, that are embedded in this image we've talked about this semester. Yeah? Does that God holding the outward looking God? Oh, the, the, right here? Yeah, yeah, so there's an apple right there. What, is, what does the apple symbolize? Right, certainly this is an ana like a, a, a nod to, our, uh, to Christian origin myths, right, of Forbidden knowledge, okay? That's, that's one important thing. Well, it was meant to be read from right to left. So what's going on as we focus in here on the right? What's, what's this image of? Okay, so certainly uh, family structure. Yes? Looks like they have a newborn. A newborn, right? We're talking about fertility. So in enters the, the human being as a newborn, right, on the right side of the stage. Here we have this figure in the center that has their, their arms upraised, right? So the sex of the figure is sort of ambiguous. It could be either, it could go either male or female. But what do we, we study body language, right? What does uh, upraised body posture indicate? Yeah. It's about to what? Shoot three? Okay, and what, and what would that... So when we talk about body language that's extended outwards, what does that signify? Confidence, power, right? Self-actualization. And this individual is in the prime of their life. Here we have, again, an emphasis of the apple. What about here? What's going on with this part of the figure? In contrast, especially to the, to the beginning. So the contrast between old versus young, right? So signifying on the right side of the stage, you see an individual entering their life and at the end of it, exiting, right, through old age and death. And then we discussed a little bit about this, this figure that's overseeing everything. So what this painting is getting at, and the reason why Wilson adopted it, is because... The title of it is Du Venonu, Que Sommes Nous, Nous Allons Nous. Does anybody have any French background in here? Yeah, what does this translate? It's been a while. Been a while. <laughs> yeah? Yeah, yeah. Where have we come from? Who are we and where are we going? So this isn't a statement more or less, it's actually a question. And that question has been the theme of this entire semester. It's why I've been coming to class. So, we've talked a lot about a lot this semester. Um, but we've, I, at the very least, I've attempted to keep things in perspective. Right? We've talked about evolutionary theory. talked about uh, early hominin evolution, early culture via stone tool technology. We talked about Neanderthals 
as a rival or compatriot sister species. Um, we've talked about subsistence strategies, right? We've talked about religion. To figure out the trajectory of all this, we need to see how things have gone in the past 10,000 years. This past, this little snapshot, this little window, period of time, this emergence of civilization that's occurred since the Holocene, the past 10,000 years, things have been accelerating in a way that has never happened before. And we'll see that this is actually the theme of today's lecture. First, we're going to start with a picture here. And I want to do a little bit more deconstruction. What do you see when you look at this image? What? A big old cow. Okay, good. What else? A cheeseburger. In its totality, this is a cheeseburger. Side of chips, right? Yeah. Ah, manufacturing industry. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just saying there's a lot of logistics that go into getting that burger to you. Okay, yeah. The end, this end product is, I would argue, extremely divorced from the source, from its source. Yeah. Photoshop, perhaps, yeah. Um, it's it, with uh, media campaigns actually have specialists who, uh, they're like called food artists or something. They actually make the food look palatable as it's being photographed. Yeah, that's a whole industry. Yeah. Okay, cooked. We can bring in the controlled use of energy. Yeah. So what I see when I'm looking at this image is a monument to the Neolithic. Everything on here is a product of agriculture. Everything on here, from the tomatoes, the lettuce, the pickles, the cheese, well, if we can call that cheese, more like solidified sugar fats, right? Um, the sesame seed bun, the potato chips, all of this is the product of artificial selection and is a product of domestication, controlling the sexual reproduction of animals and plants, and in this, this is the ultimate extension of it in the fact that it's been post-processed in a way that is most easily palatable by a post-industrial culture. This is a monument to Neolithic. So we've seen in the last 12,000 years lots of cultural change, an exponential increase in cultural change. We see the origins of agriculture, the origins of sedentary societies. We see higher population densities, and really this is going to be one of the cruxes of today's entire theme, population density. Because with population density, we'll see that there's a relationship with population density and innovation. You see more food on the basis of these sedentary societies and higher population densities. You've got to have the food to be able to match consumption, right? And then it's very extension, you see industrialization, of which we are in a culture that is post-industrial. So at the beginning of the Neolithic, we had significant changes in the climate. The climate became warmer. Um, we had a massive shift from tundra landscapes and tundra environments to forest environments. Herd animals either went extinct or retreated into what we call refugia. So places, the little pockets of environment where they can still hold out against incoming uh, competitors. So these temperate environments were much more suitable to our needs as we could uh, increase the breadth of plant resources that we were exploiting. So we have a shift in diet towards greater reliance on plant foods in the past 12,000 years. And here's just a, uh, since the Mesolithic, we're getting about 12,500 BP. Uh, we can see here, this is going back millions of years actually, uh, this scale of global temperature. And it stayed relatively consistent throughout the Holocene. And now we're uh, re-emerging into warmer uh, climates for an arguably a host of different reasons. But we won't get into that today. So early civilization can be dated back to about 11,000 years before present. So you have to have, uh, for, for this to qualify as early civilization, you have control over plant and animal reproductions, quintessential. Remember, the one thing that separates us from foragers, that foragers are the subsistence strategy 
that has no reliance whatsoever on controlling the uh, reproduction of plants and animals. So that separates us from foragers. So you have the domestication of plants and animals, from ranging from wheat, barley, goats, sheep. And with this increased intensification, you also have the solidifying effect of territory. And it turns out there's going to be some serious consequences to territorialization and to needing to defend the surplus of resources that you're accruing through this agricultural process. So Lewin has noted that the agricultural or the Neolithic revolution, as such, the Neolithic transition involved increasing sedentism and social complexity, usually followed by gradual adoption of plant and animal domestication. So these are the foundations of the Holocene right here. We see a shift in material culture. Um, we see a continuing trend with the Upper Paleolithic. Remember we were talking about the variation in the Upper Paleolithic, uh, much more variation in stone tool, stone tool culture and technology. In the, in the material culture of the Holocene, you see microliths predominate, so these little techno units, an increasing number of techno units. Right here we have an ADS. Does anybody know what the function of an ADS is for? Why would it be associated with the Holocene, like agriculture? Mm -hmm. Yes, precisely. So you've got these little small microliths that are then embedded through resin and different glue-like properties into a shaft. And this tool is specifically designed to hew wheat. Right? So you grab the wheat, and instead of having to pull each stalk out manually, you can get the tuft of it and cut. Right? So this was an innovation for uh, an agricultural environment. Also, you see different weapons that have multiple blades on it. And the advantage here is that with these small micro blades, you can have one fall off or get lost, and all you have to do is get out of your pocket several backups right, and insert it in. And you've got a restored blade. Mm -hmm. Isn't that kind of like the weaponry that the Aztecs had? Those uh, that they had with the obsidian? Yeah, so, yeah, absolutely. Um, and the Aztecs are in an area that independently evolved agriculture. There's five, as we'll see coming up, there's five different places where agriculture independently sprung up, and in that area is one of them. We see polished tools for food processing, like this, so a mortar pestle. With this, you can start processing seeds and grains in a way that can allow you to make what? Bread. Yeah, bread. Did someone say bread? Yes. Yeah, bread. Um, yeah. Bread is going to be foundational for civilization, right? With complex carbohydrates can feed a lot of people. We see increased sophistication in polished tools, so axes and chisels and adzes. You have an actual axe head right here, which is a prerequisite tool needed to build complex wooden architecture. So what kinds of things are they building with these uh, axes? Yeah. Probably houses and fishing boats. Houses and fishing boats. Great. Yeah, absolutely. At this point in time, coastal resources are being exploited more than ever. Okay, so if you've got a boat, which you can't really build a boat with as awesome as the Achillean hand axe was, you can't build something as precisely articulated as a boat with it, right? So keep that in mind. So you've got to have lots of innovation uh, to be able to match the needs of Neolithic peoples. And here we were just referencing this. We have the spread of agriculture. So these are uh, six different locations where agriculture independently originated, as far as archaeologists can tell. You have Mesoamerica, South America, West Africa, Southwest Asia, Southeast Asia and East Asia. And uh, one of the oldest examples, as we'll be exploring, we'll be taking some examples from the Middle East, right here, truly is the, the crucible of civilization. It's where you find the oldest advents of civilization. So yeah, you can argue for influences here, but since we're talking about something that occurred in the Holocene, you certainly have to argue for independent origins in North America, right? Now we have access to bones, not fossils, right? We're not dealing with things that are fossilized that are millions of years old. Now we're dealing with evidence that we can derive ancient DNA from. 
So we can map the genomes of the kinds of, and, and the changes of the species that human beings were exploiting throughout this time. Here's some uh, examples of Near East domesticates. This right here is wild maize. That's what maize looks like in its wild form. Does that look edible? No, it doesn't look very edible, does it? Ancient humans, Holocene humans, took this and through the process of artificial selection made this. So, yeah, that whole argument we had a, a couple series of lectures ago about GMOs, genetically modified organisms, right? So that is a GMO right there. Been around for a long time. Human beings are now just directly tapping into the genome, but we've been taking phenotypes and manipulating phenotypes for thousands of years. So here we have some examples here. Chickpea, lentil, olive, fig, almonds, barley, apricot. Again, we talked about the emergence of uh, wheat and barley. These were the first two domesticates that were ever found. And incidentally, what do they make? Beer. Beer, yeah, and we talked about the function of that. Uh, we speculated anyway. So perhaps that had an impact on civilization in and of itself. And interestingly, at around this point, not before, but around this point, you start seeing things like uh, salt being exploited. So particularly, uh, you'll have areas where you have the, the dried salt, and then it's been taken and harvested. You actually harvest the salt, and it becomes a rare commodity, right? So we see major social shifts throughout the Neolithic. We see bigger sites, more permanent buildings. We talked about hunter-gatherers are relatively equal, right? The equality is a little bit more fairly distributed across hunter-gatherers. Um, if you aren't feeling the particular uh, politics of a, of a band, you can then lead to another band, right? A little bit harder to do when you have social immobility, right? So social inequality becomes a factor for the first time, really, on a mass scale in the Holocene. We have a definite departure from previous types of religions, and we'll see the scale here pretty soon. But previous religions are animistic and shamanistic. Here we have state-endorsed religions for the first time. We have warfare going from uh, a small-scale, simple warfare to a complex, large-scale warfare. We'll talk about the implications of that as well. You have, for, and to the joy of archaeologists everywhere, you have cemeteries. You have places where human beings are being systematically buried after death. You have, because of all these things, you have hereditary leadership. Remember we talked about chiefdoms and how that's a permanent position. As a consequence of all this, you actually see poor health and poor quality of life through time. So here's an example of uh, the Neolithic here on the x-axis all the way through the Bronze and Iron Age. And you can see here uh, on this scale is the percentage of infectious disease and childhood stress. So interestingly, agriculture and sedentary lives began a ratcheting process of overall disease and stress on bodies. Why was this? Why might this be? <coughs> yeah, poor sanitation. And if it's infectious, then you have, a higher, uh, you have a higher disease vector quotient, right? You have more people to spread the disease to. If you're a hunter-gatherer and someone in the band is sick, there's, you're nomadic. You can more effectively quarantine. You can move, right, if it's waste-related. We see, for the first time, transformation of the elements. So you see pottery as a great example. The uses of pottery, storage, cooking, transportation, perhaps even social prestige, right? Because look at this piece of very simple pottery relative to this piece of, of pottery. An artisan, again, interesting because that's a specialization, an artisan crafted this, painted this, and dedicated a significant portion of sweat equity to develop this. So not just anybody can have that. People of high social class, of high social prestige, are going to have these more ornate potters. So you see transformation of the elements. You see the first towns, for example, Jericho and Katel Hoyuk. Um, 
Jericho right here, Katel Hoyuk right here. So Neolithic houses, we start with mud brick stone walls for foundation, uh, st stone walls and stone foundation. Uh, in fact, this, is, this technology is still being used. When I was in East Africa and Uganda, uh, individuals would be crafting the base foundation for their house, houses manually with mud brick. So this technology is still used. It's been around for several thousand years, and it creates domiciles that look a little bit something like this. Yeah? In, in Mali, they actually have the largest mud brick building in the world, which is uh, the, the, the Zhang Mosque. Yeah. And every year, before the wet season, they always have to... Add, new add mud to, to it. Yeah, add new mud to keep it waterproof. Yep, so constant renovation. Yeah. Right? Yep. Yep. Site locations, we see here these first, the Katel Hayuk, somewhere around Turkey, and then Jericho, uh, very close to Egypt. So, Katel Hayuk in Turkey, 6,250 years to 5,400 BC. It is known to have uh, controlled the obsidian trade in the area. What's obsidian? Do you remember what obsidian is? It's a rock, yeah. And yes? Yes, vol volcanic glass. So relatively rare resource. Only specific uh, areas are going to have it. It's, it's created uh, by cooling lava, essentially, right? So it's volcanic glass. And it can be flint napped to produce very sharp edges. So a valued commodity. And this place... Uh, dominated that local economy. So, so far there's been 158 structures that have been uncovered. Um, you have mud structure with plastic wall, perhaps evidence for raised platforms. And you can see here that you can access the room only through the roof. What function might this be? Or is there a function? Is it just a byproduct of something? Okay, so... Not only is it protected from macro predators, it's also protecting perhaps from rival uh, cultures, rival populations that might want to take the resources that you're accruing. Yeah. Stronger foundation to support the mm, Perhaps, perhaps. What I'm trying to get at here is that, what, so think of it from a civil engineer standpoint, these were the first proto villages and they were organic in nature. Katili Hoyuk also had about 40 plus shrines. The walls were decorated and they generally had a fertility or death motif. You see women giving birth to bulls. Um, there isn't yet, this isn't pure agriculture. This is a mixed economy with hunting and gathering as ancillary to uh, agriculture. But you do see wheat, barley, and peas uh, in terms of plant production. You see domesticated cattle used for meat, hides, and milk, right? So they had, a, a, for the first time, a, a complex mix between these different types of subsistence strategies. So this is a reconstruction of one of these shrines, see, a, of a very strong bull motif, fertility motif. So the bull would have been a central animal to these people. And here's how they, they would have had a roof, Right? None of that stuff, though, is going to persist in the archaeological record. And then you go down stairs. So, Katel Hoyuk is not large enough to be called a city. It's more like a proto-village. There's no apparent public architecture. And there's no apparent specialization of occupation. Right? So we don't have something that is quite urban at the moment. Um, and there's certainly no evidence for writing. It's a few thousand years until we can get to, to writing. So with any, as a foundation of any large-scale society, writing is absolutely key. Going back 6,000 years before present, you have cuneiform, which evolved into phonemes. Phonemes are essentially sounds, right? So we have an alphabet that each symbol denotes a sound, and then the way we mix them together produces a word, right? Cuneiform was pictorial. Each symbol represented an object. Here we have, for the first time with large-scale societies, monumental public architecture. And the hypothesis as to how cuneiform first developed was a way to represent, symbolically represent, time for labor. And really, if you think about it, this is the first attempt at money as well. Right? So you have these tokens that individuals gave, uh, were given to by employers for time in 
labor. And that's essentially all money is, is a abstract, a symbolic abstract that represents upon a social agreement. Is there any inherent value in money? No, there's no inherent value besides the social compact that it represents to the people who value it. But it's, an, it's artificial. It's completely artificial. You can't eat money, right? So Wells argues that writing has the ability to put, agreement, uh, put agreements, laws, commandments on record. It made the growth of states larger than the old city-states possible. The command of the priest or king and his seal could go far beyond his sight and voice and could survive his death. Think about this for a second. Information from an individual could survive past that individual's death for the first time. What are the consequences of this? Yeah? Knowledge can accumulate over time like the law. Okay, laws can persist through time, transgenerationally. Yeah. We can tell stories. No longer uh, are stories bound by folklore and oral transmission. Stories, origin myths, laws, commandments, they can all be put down for perpetuity. And this changes the game because before this, the only thing that was recognized as a vessel for information was DNA. It's our genetic code. The only way to leave legacy was to reproduce. After this, an emergent phenomena occurs. You can leave information for posterity's sake outside your DNA. Very important consequences. Language, according to Richard Dawkins, is also central to a new and powerful evolutionary force. As far as a human lifetime is concerned, the only kind of evolutionary change we're likely to see very much of is not genetic evolution at all, it's cultural evolution. And if we put a Darwinian spin on that, then we're going to be talking about the differential survival of memes as opposed to genes. Memes are ideas, habits, skills, gestures, stories, songs, anything which we pass from person to person by imitation. We copy them. Now, just as genes are copied inside all the cells of our body and passed on in, in reproduction, memes are copied by our brains and our behavior, and they're passed from person to person. And Basically, this is the emergence of the sex of ideas. It's ideas reproducing and ideas being selected by populations. So think of, when I think of things like political philosophies, like capitalism versus communism, right? These are essentially just abstract ideas. These are ideas that are competing for the shared attention of the populations that are exposed to them. And depending on the frequency of their use and their success and their reproduction, you have one idea winning out over the other, just like you do with genes. All right? So that's the, that's the classic analog. So here we have religion, the evidence, first evidence for large-scale and societal places of worship. Before this, we have something that's much more simple. So here we have a really cool uh, table, and here are all the types of societies that we've discussed about in this cultural anthropology class. We've talked about forging bands, right? Um, forging bands, hunter-gatherers, and their con conception of the supernatural was zoomorphic in nature, right? And you didn't have a full-time specialist. You had a shaman that was most likely a part-time specialist, part-time uh, conduit to the, the spiritual world, which was animistic and shamanistic in nature. So what's animism, real quick, so we're all on the same page? Yeah? That um, everything in nature has a spirit of itself? Yeah, the idea that a rock has a spirit or a mountain range has a spirit. So ge ge geographical locations, inanimate objects can have spirits, animals have spirits, and the origins of human beings are usually interlaced in this connection, right? Then you have food-producing tribes, right? horticulture, agriculture, and uh, you see usually there are several deities that have some control over nature. So this is, as soon as you become reliant on things like wheat or barley to survive year in, year out, 
you're going to have a transition from focusing on animals per se, wild animals, and the relationship with nature. You're going to have a focus more or less on the things that are prerequisites for a good bounty. Right? So what are re what's really popular in these in terms of deities? Yeah. Rain, right? Rain, because without rain, there's no food. Without food, there's no life. Right? So you, you see a common theme with rain gods. So here you have part-time specialists, um, and usually there's some associated uh, ritual that the community undertakes to ensure that these several deities are going to be cooperative. This is a communal-based religion. Then you have chiefdoms and proto-states. And... Here we see hierarchical pantheon with powerful deities, okay, which matches the types of patrilineal and patrilocal individuals and, and uh, uh, patterns of subsistence that you see during these times. So you have here specialized priesthoods that, as we discussed, these priesthoods actually enforce and give power to those individuals that have the power. So there's a feedback loop between politics and religion. We call these Olympian. Then we have modern states. Modern states have a shared characteristic of having uh, the concept of a supreme being. So this is where monotheism comes in, right? And then you have all types of specialists. You have priests, ministers, parishioners, right? That take place in the, the state-endorsed uh, religion. Here's just an interesting table ranking uh, internal religious similarity. So at the most diverse, you have your Hinduism, Buddhism, Christianity. It's most diverse. Then you have most unified, Baha'i, Zoroastrianism, Sikhism, Islam. And here are the major world religions by percent, percentage of world population. Uh, currently 33% Christianity, 16% non-religious, 21% Islamic. And you see varying percentages for different ones. When I see this, I cannot help but think about memes, competing memes. For what are they if they're not ideas? They're constantly in competition, right? You see in the Holocene monumental architecture, things like Stonehenge, right? Things that you would need an entire community, and you'd probably need a powerful communal uh, uh, goal, shared goal to construct, you see distinct communal identities. So you see, even in the material culture that they're leaving behind, you see microcultures and macrocultures that are, that are taking root, right? Again, you can think of these as memes as well. Different, different identities that are being embedded in the kinds of material culture that they leave behind. Then the Bronze Age, you see a mastery of technology in metallurgy, right? So the earliest known instances of metallurgy go back to about 6,000 years BP. Interesting, co coincide with the advent of, uh, of written language. And we have here metal, heavy metal working. But interestingly, some of the most focused attention in terms of developing and innovating technology went into warfare. And this is where you see the advent of metal being transformed to protect Individuals at first with high status, and then as a common group to outcompete other civilizations. Right? So you get that classic arms race. It begins 6,000 years before present. And that's when you get large scale external complex warfare. Right? This is what Turney High in 1949 described as warfare above the military horizon. Okay, so before this hunter gathers, yeah, we can have a almost, uh, uh, the analog could be chimpanzee intercommunity violence, right, with internal or simple war. But you lose the analog with chimpanzee levels of intercommunity violence once you go to the military horizon. There is no analog once you get to this point. Yeah. Is it total war yes, that's where I'm total war too. I know they're awesome. <laughs> Had to throw that in there. So, you have two early states here as, a, as an example. You have the Selic Ziggurat. Um, this, this is a city state in the Mesopotamian Egypt, about 4,500 years before present. 
Notice this architecture. It's massive scale architecture. You have to be able to control a large group of individuals to accomplish architecture on this scale. And then, of course, Egypt is renowned for this level of architecture with the pyramids. So the Mesopotamia left us a powerful legacy. You have basically the first states, first socio-political institutions that created metallurgy or, and developed metallurgy and writing, as we've discussed. But also, for the first time, we have mathematics. So we have a base 10 number system and standardization of measurement. Think about this, though, because all these things right here are prerequisites to the scientific method. Science can't exist in the form that we understand it today without these prerequisite traits. And this results in a, an astounding series of developments with increased understanding of astronomy, cartography, medicine, technology like the wheel, chariots, sailboats, right? That can actually do deep sea exploration. And then there are, this is all precursor to what we now understand to be an everyday occurrence, the megacity. And there are serious consequences to the megacity. Cities are the crucible of civilization. They have been expanding, urbanization has been expanding at an exponential rate in the last 200 years so that by the second part of this century, the planet will be completely dominated by cities. Cities are the origins of global warming, impact on the environment, health, pollution, disease, finance, economies, energy, are all problems that are confronted by having cities. That's where the, all these problems come from. And the tsunami of problems that we feel we're facing in terms of sustainability questions are actually a reflection of the exponential increase in urbanization across the planet. Here's some numbers. 200 years ago, the United States was less than a few percent urbanized. It's now more than 82 percent. The planet has crossed the halfway mark a few years ago. China's building 300 new cities in the next 20 years. Now listen to this. Every week for the foreseeable future until 2050, every week more than a million people are being added to our cities. This is going to affect everything. Everybody in this room, if you stay alive, is going to be affected by what's happening in cities and this extraordinary phenomenon. However, cities, despite having this kind of negative aspect to them, are also the solution because cities are the vacuum cleaners, the magnets that have sucked up creative people, creating ideas, innovation, wealth, and so on. So we have this kind of dual nature, and so I, there's an urgent need for a scientific theory of cities. Now, these are my comrades in arms. This work has been done with an extraordinary group of people, and they've done all the work, and I'm the great bullshitter that tries to bring it all together. <laughs> so here's the problem. This is what we all want. The 10 billion people on the planet in 2050 want to live in places like this, having things like this, doing things like this, with economies that are growing like this, not realizing that entropy produces things like this, <laughs> this, this and this, and the question is, is that what Edinburgh and London and New York are going to look like in 2050? When we started forming communities eight to 10,000 years ago, the top one is wages as a function of size plotted in the same way, and the bottom one is you lot, super creatives, plotted in the same way, and what you see is a scaling phenomenon, but most important in this, the exponent, the analog to that three quarters for the metabolic rate is bigger than one. It's about 1.15 to 1.2. Here it is, which says that the bigger you are, the more you have per capita, unlike biology. Higher wages, more super creative people per capita as you get bigger, more patents per capita, 
more crime per capita, and we've looked at everything, more AIDS cases, flu, etc. And here, they're all plotted together. Just to show you, what we've plotted here is income, GDP, GDP of the city, crime and patents all on one graph, and you can see they all follow the same line. And here's the statement, if you double the size of a city, from 100,000 to 200,000, from a million to 2 million, 10 to 20 million, doesn't matter, then systematically you get a 15% increase in wages, wealth, number of AIDS cases, number of police, anything you can think of. It goes up by 15%, and you have a 15% savings on the infrastructure. This, no doubt, is the reason why a million people a week are gathering in cities, because they think, they think that all those wonderful things like creative people, wealth, income, is what attracts them, forgetting about the ugly and the bad. What is the reason for this? Well, I don't have the time to tell you about all the mathematics, but underlying this is the social networks, because this is a universal phenomenon. This 15% rule is true no matter where you are on the planet. Japan, Chile, Portugal, Scotland, doesn't matter. Always all the data shows it's the same, despite the fact that these cities have evolved independently. Something universal is going on. The universality, to repeat, is us, that we are the city and it is our interactions and the clustering of those interactions. So there it is, said it again. So if it is those networks in that mathematical structure, unlike biology, which had sublinear scaling, economies of scale, you had the slowing of the pace of life as you get bigger. If it's social networks with superlinear scaling, more per capita, then the theory says that you increase the pace of life. The bigger you are, life gets faster. On the left is the heart rate, showing biology. On the right is the speed of walking in a bunch of European cities, showing that increase. Okay. Lastly, I want to talk about growth. This is what we had in biology, just to repeat. Economies of scale gave rise to this kind of sigmoidal behavior. You grow fast and then stop. It's part of our resilience. That would be bad for economies and cities. And indeed, one of the wonderful things about the theory is that if you have superlinear scaling from wealth creation and innovation, then indeed you get from the same theory, beautiful rising exponential curve, lovely. And in fact, if you compare it to data, it fits very well with the development of cities and economies. But it has a terrible catch. And the catch is that this system is destined to collapse. And it's destined to collapse for many reasons, kind of Malthusian reasons, that you run out of resources. And how do you avoid that? Well, we've done it before. What we do is, as we grow and we approach the collapse, a major innovation takes place. And we start over again. And we start over again as we approach the next one and so on. So there's this continuous cycles of innovation that is necessary in order to sustain growth and avoid collapse. The catch, however, to this, is that you have to innovate faster and faster and faster. So the image is that we're not only on a treadmill that's going faster, but we have to change the treadmill faster and faster. We have to accelerate on a continuous basis. And the question is, can we, as socioeconomic beings, avoid a heart attack? So what I think is going on, especially when you look at the archaeological record in the past several thousand years, you see that the moments where you have the most acute stress, you have the highest de population densities, and you see the most stress in the system, those are the moments in time where human beings innovate at the highest level. Right? So he was talking about that constant series of innovation, that exponential increase in innovation. Right? The question is, can we keep up the pace? And as an optimist, I say yes. I think that, and this is where I'm going to propose something that's relatively radical, uh, probably not too many anthropologists would suggest this, but I think we need more people. I think we need more people. I don't think 7 billion is enough. We just broke 7 billion. I say we need 15 billion. We need 25 billion. Because with that, you get that clustering of super creatives, and you get an innovation that's above the curve. It's always 15% above the curve if it, if it obeys these mathematical properties that are universal. So... If we stay on this rock, then 
we were destined to go extinct anyway. It was a probability of one that we were going to go extinct. But we are the first species that's ever come into existence that has the potential to colonize other planets. In this way, perhaps we could keep the game going. So, E.O. Wilson states that the current state of play is that we have created a Star Wars civilization with Stone Age emotions, medieval institutions, and godlike technology. And I think that's a pretty uh, innovative quote there. Um, I, I think, really, it comes down to this. Can our hardware, which is based off of millions of years of evolution, can it keep pace with the rapid exponential increase in cultural evolution? And our, our culture and our, our, our species is going to have some really hard-hitting questions, questions that hit at the very foundations of morality, because for the first time, we're going to be able to manipulate the human genome on a top-down system, right? We're actually going to be able to select which characters and which traits we deem desirable in the next generation. That's not science fiction. That's going to happen in our lifetime, right? These are major foundational questions about where our species is going. And unless we know where we've come from, we have no way to contextualize that question of where we need to go. So, in review, we've talked about some things that use anthropology to inform who we are as a species, right? Talked about mating strategies, we talked about the rules of attraction, talked about eusociality and how our species became ecological dominance on the planet. We've talked about social interaction, the power of the limbic system to affect how we communicate to each other. We've talked about the meaning of race. We've talked about the definition of subspecies, right? We've talked about how race actually doesn't really have a biological utility, but it does have social meaning. We've talked about ethics, the origins of morality, in-group versus out-group. And we've talked about universals, cultural universals. And this brings us to the fundamental conflict of nature versus nurture. So, there have been, yeah, you have a question. Grenade next to the I, I'll, be, I'll be coming back to the grenade in a second. <laughs> Good eye, though. So, we have this really interesting pre-adaptive sequence, which makes our ascendance all the more improbable. It's really quite a remarkable tale. The fact that we are even here to talk about and to speculate about these things is rather improbable. We had to have had a series of pre-adaptations that even gave us the opportunity to have what we have today. So 65 million years ago, we transitioned from terrestrial existence only to arboreal. That evolved hands and feet that were built for grasping. Furthermore, six and a half million years ago, the first bipeds evolved, at least in our lineage, hominins, right? Freed up the hands for a myriad of uses. We had the control of fire, right, that could process food in a way that unleashed a watershed event of calories that fueled the brain for the next two million years and was a prerequisite for eusociality, for the campsite, something actually worthy of group defense, and, of course, something that I'm interested in, comfortable sleep, because you can't transition from an arboreal sleeping platform to the ground without use of controlled energy. And then you've got language. If you don't have language, none of this even matters, because then you can't have the, the prerequisite to the cultural evolution that we have today, because you can't transmit knowledge on a mass scale, on a group level. So... Coming back to the grenade, do you remember the, the analogy that we brought up very early in the semester, right? Yeah. Is it worth pulling the pin? And what I want to convince you guys is that it is, right? If you pull the pin, what are the consequences? Yeah, maybe the consequences are bad. But taking in, understanding evolutionary theory and understanding how it has impacted who we are is the only way to ensure that we know where we're And there are existential implications, right? Things that hit at a very deep philosophical core. So everyone here, I'm sure, has heard of the free will versus determinism debate, right? Do we have free will? Or is everything on a causally determined course, right, from the advent of the Big Bang? Is it one unbroken chain of cause and effect? This was something that was 
the, one of the most famous uh, examples of this debate came between Einstein and Niels Bohr at the beginning of the 20th century. And Einstein, famous for his determinism, he believed very, uh, very deeply in his core that uh, free will was at best an illusion. He thought that free will, it was good that people thought that they had free will, but that it, on the quantum level, doesn't work, was his argument. And his, so his famous quote was, God doesn't play dice with the universe. And Niels Bohr would always counter, Einstein, stop telling God what to do. Right? <laughs> so this was, if you look back, I, I read Einstein's biography, and it's uh, uh, by, by Isaacson. It's a brilliant read, good 1,100 pages, but really fascinating read. Einstein was a fascinating person. Uh, and there's letters between him and Niels Bohr on the subject. One of the most interesting dialogues, I think, that's ever taken place between two human beings. So in the next couple minutes here, I'll have, has anybody ever heard of Jason Silva? Yeah, there are a couple people. Now everyone will, have be, will be exposed to Jason Silva. But he'll wrap up in about two minutes what I think is a thematic to this entire semester. You know, I love this idea of radical openness, the free exchange of information, the free flow of ideas, creating spaces in which ideas can have sex, as Matt Ridley talks about. And this is huge because it turns out that ideas are just as real as the neurons they inhabit, as James Glick tells us. You know, a new kingdom rises above the biosphere denizens of this kingdom are ideas, because ideas have retained some of the properties of organisms, it turns out. They leap from brain to brain. They compete for the limited resources of our attention. They have infectivity. They have spreading power. They are what Richard Dawkins calls the new replicators, born from the primordial soup of human culture. Their vector of transmission is language and electronic communications. And though ideas are not made of nucleic acid, they have achieved more evolutionary change and at a rate that leaves the old gene panting far behind. You know, Ray Kurzweil says our ability to create virtual models in our heads combined with our modest looking thumbs was sufficient to usher in the secondary force of evolution called technology. And it will continue until the entire universe is at our fingertips. This is unbelievable stuff. It speaks to the telescoping nature of evolutionary change. More change in the last hundred years than in the last billion years. Terence McKenna actually wrote that from the moment that human beings invented language, biological evolution essentially ceased and evolution became a cultural epigenetic phenomenon. Now, we take in matter of low organization, we put it through our mental filters and we extrude it in the form of space shuttles and iPhones. You know, the Imaginary Foundation tells us that what imagination does is it allows us to conceive of delightful future possibilities, pick the most amazing one, and pull the present forward to meet it. You know, imagine how impoverished this world would have been if we hadn't invented the technology of the oil painting in time for Van Gogh, or the technology of the musical instrument in time for Beethoven and Mozart to unfurl through it, you know, with the revolutions in biotechnology and nanotechnology, the free exchange of information is allowing us to conceive of radical new things. Freeman Dyson says, in the future, new generation of artists will be writing genomes with the fluency that Blake and Byron wrote verses. What is great in man, said Nietzsche, is that he is a bridge and not an end. You know, we're on a trajectory, smack in the middle between the born and the made, wrote Kevin Kelly. And so, radical openness, it's huge. It's a universe of possibility. It's gray infused by color. It's the invisible revealed. It's the mundane blown away by awe. We need to cultivate radical openness as a way of participating and accelerating evolution. Wow. If you'll permit me, I'm going to get a little bit philosophical. Um, so, it's your responsibility throughout your lifetime. You've got maybe one chance to figure this question out, the question of questions. What's the meaning of life, right? So, from the perspective of biological anthropologists, I, there's one word that actually sums it up for me. One word, above all others. That word is legacy. So, for the first time, when we begin the transition in the Neolithic to be able to write and to communicate. For that first time, we could reproduce ideas, right? We were no longer bound by the genetic code. So you've got two ways to attain legacy. You can attain legacy either the way we've done it for 500 million years, that is genetically, and I think that is a worthy cause, right? 
That is, you are an unbroken chain of 500 million years of evolution. And if you don't reproduce, you're that dead end. In that, you're that link that is a dead end in that chain. So reproduction on a genetic level is very important, I believe. Also, you can reproduce memetically. You can contribute, right? So I think the sum of the story is how much memetic genetic contribution you make to the next generation. So keep in mind, as uh, Wilson describes, 100 billion people, 100 billion, have existed. So you could be here to have this one brief moment of sentience. So go out of this class and uh, dominate. All right, done for the semester. And if you'll, if you'll do me one last favor here, uh, I've got my evals. So I'm going to pass these out. Can anybody volunteer to take these to the WR, the Anthro Building? Thank you very much. Okay. It's all the final. It's all up on Web Campus. So it's going to be like sometime next week. Yep. Yep. All right. So I'll pass this out.